Welcome to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham. If you have a comment, email it to me. Box13 at greatdetectives.net uh, Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives and become one of our friends on Facebook. Facebook.com slash Radio Detectives Well, I do want to encourage you, if you've not already, to pick up a copy of my new ebook, What Made the Golden Age Shine. And this is written kind of in response to a lot of questions I've gotten about over the years. Most of this uh, stuff we listen to here was made 20, 30 years before I was even born. So the questions often ask, what's the appeal? And uh, in what made the, makes the Golden Age shine, I take a look at the qualities that makes Golden Age entertainment so meaningful even today. So it's available for your Kindle as well as uh, your Kindle app. If you have the uh, Amazon Prime membership, you can get it for free. So what made the Golden Age shine? All right, folks. Well, let's go ahead and we'll take a listen to today's episode of Frank Race, The Adventure of the Diver's Loot. The Adventures of Frank Race, starring Paul Dubov. <laughs> War changed many things, the face of the earth and the people on it. Before the war, Frank Race worked as an attorney, but he traded his law books for the cloak and dagger of the OSS. And when it was over, his former life was over too. Adventure had become his business. The Adventures of Frank Race. Now we join Frank Race for The Adventure of the Diver's Loot. London, under a heavy rush of cumulonimbus clouds, scudding thunderheads that looked as though they might knock off your head at any moment. I just left the embankment and was hurrying across Westminster Bridge when... Hey, Race! Race, wait a second! It was Mark Donovan running to catch me. If for some reason the sight of a New York taxi driver of foot in London seemed incongruous enough to rate a grin. Uh, uh, well, I give up. What's so funny? Because a guy has to lope like a high boat bank tail to come up with his Sorry, smoke. Mark. I was just thinking how different this is compared to ramming a cab along uh, 42nd Street. Uh, it ain't so different. Just had to hack my way through a jam. It was worse than going for the exes on fight night. God damn, you fell this square. Slow down. You're wheezing like a sump pump. Uh, it ought to be. I even... Hey, I almost forgot. I've been pulling this marathon because a guy wants to see us. Personality named Rhodes. Lawrence Rhodes? Yeah, yeah. Very pip-pip and cheerio. Wants to see you pronto. Offices in Eaton Square, you know. I can't take on another assignment. We should be getting back to New York. But I'll see Rhodes anyway. Everything about Lawrence Rhodes was thin. His weight, his hair, the wispy line of his very blonde mustache. He looked as though he might be the operator of an exclusive ladies' shop. Actually, he served as British representative for Acme Indemnity. And during the war, he had cracked a Normandy beachhead as leader of a tough commando unit. Decent of you to come, Race. We feel it's imperative that we have an American in on this, since it's an American venture to begin with. Well, and you when it's a case of children losing their lives, Oh, forgive me. What were you saying? I was going to say that... What's this about kids losing their lives? A little French lad killed aboard the salvage vessel. Rhodes, I'm afraid you're going to have to start this from the beginning. Of course. Old habit of mine, assuming people have previous knowledge of what I'm talking about. Forgive me. All this stems from a salvage operation just across the channel. But before we discuss it further, I want you to meet someone. <laughs> He left me for a few minutes and came back with a husky-looking man of about 50. A man he introduced as Charles Menefee. Mr. Menefee can tell you much more about this matter than I can, Race. 
He's in charge of the operation. It's a cleanup job. My company secured the contract for dragging the harbor off Sherburne. We've been picking up the residue of stuff that was sunk there during the war, particularly after D-Day. I happened to be on the vessel in question when this affair took place. Besides the mishap to the boy, we lost a diver by the name of Joe Donna. Just disappeared, leaving nothing but the broken signal and airline. How old was the boy, and how did he happen to be aboard? He was 12, a waterfront kid that had been made a sort of a mascot by the men. Apparently, they smuggled him on the vessel for this voyage. It was all pretty much of a mix-up, and no one seemed to know anything about it. That brings up an important point, Rex. Acme is indemnifying men of his company against all liability, and if this youngster died on that vessel, then we'll assume our full obligation. But we should know. If he really did die on the boat, your opinion on the report will decide that for us. What sort of accident was it? That's the peculiar part of it. The thing probably can't be called an accident at all. You see, the boy was shot to death. Menifee and I left Rhodes' office together and stood talking on the street while waiting for cabs. I was to fly across the channel that evening. He would meet me in Cherbourg on the following day. And as we planned this, a car sidled up to the curb. A gleaming new sedan with the rakishness of a destroyer stopped directly alongside us and a quiet voice spoke from the rear seat. Don't you guys try rushing off anywhere. You'll develop more holes than a bum alibi. From the look of him, he might have been an usher at your sister's wedding. He even had the carnation on his lapel. With the manner of a maestro handling a rare fiddle, he lifted the submachine gun he'd been holding in his lap. Get your hooks behind your head and get in here with me. Should be an enjoyable ride. It's a beautiful car. A most beautiful car. Ain't bad for a foreign job. Okay, Connie. But take it easy. We don't want to have to brush off any nosy cop. Now you're being discreet. In this country, the object of people who carry artillery... We carry what we like anywhere we go. Nothing like self-confidence. We haven't met before, have we? I never forget a face. We ain't met. I'm Frank Race. My friend's name is... I know your friend's name. Menifee. Hadn't realized I was so renowned. How about your identity? Me? I'm Freddie Troy, an independent voter. I run a little business of my own. How is business? Don't pay like it used to. Especially over here. I've got to take what he can get. Uh, well, from the looks of this car... Menifee, I'll give fair odds that the owner of this car hasn't the slightest idea as to who's driving it at this moment. You're a real hep personality, Ray. Uh, do you mind telling us what this is all about? No, I don't mind. I'm taking you out to the country for a ride. A real old-fashioned ride. But what for? Some people in Sherbert, they think they're in the way. So I'm taking care of you. When I take care of somebody, I do it right. He let his own words send him a little, just enough to relax the vigilance that had been in his attitude. For an instant, the nose of the submachine gun wandered upward away from Menifee and myself, so I lunged! <laughs> I didn't have to yell at Menifee. He was already on top of the driver as the four of us strained. <laughs> now look what you've done. I'll murder you. <laughs> All right, Troy, now here's a little payment in kind. Uh, race! The machine gun! I'll, I'll get him! Knock him cold. Are you all right, Race? I think so. Uh, you deflected that gun upward just in time. He'd have killed a dozen people. Where's Troy? Troy? Well, he must get lost in the crowd. Well, conditions are getting better in London. Last time I was here, I had to dodge bombs. This time, it was just machine gun bullets. <laughs> Cherbourg is still a disabled war veteran, showing gaunt open spaces and bombed out buildings as new testimony of the travail she endured. I met Menifee again at the Creole, one of the larger hotels. With him was a man and woman he introduced as Jim and Sandra Whalen. Jim Whalen worked as Menifee's head driver. He must have seen too many George Raft pictures, judging from the way he persisted in twirling a keychain all the time we talked. The woman, slim, young, redheaded, Rated seconds on any man's glance. Turned up anything yet, Ray? Nothing. But I have Mark Donovan out looking for leads. You haven't met him. 
He stops when it comes to trying out clues. I want you to know I'm suspending all operations for the time being. The local police seem pretty well stopped by it. The four of us sat in the lobby and watched it begin to rain outside. A condition that turned the city gray and dismal looking. Succumbing to the effect of the weather, Menifee and Jim Whalen presently left to take on a few drinks. Sandra Whalen immediately crinkled her nose at me. It's about time we had a chance to talk to each other. I get pretty tired of hearing nothing but diving and salvage. Oh? What would you prefer to discuss? You and me. Somehow I get the feeling that that could become rather complicated. Oh, I'm counting on it. You mind? What's the matter, bored? I was, until you came along. But I'm not bored now. I'm not bored at all. Sorry, Ducky. There are certain conditions under which I never move in, and this seems to involve all of them. Oh? Well, you better tell me about it. You see, I've always been led to believe I was rather attractive. You're most attractive. But there happens to be a guy in the background. A guy by the name of Jim Whalen. Who also happens to be my brother. Your brother? If you doubt it, go and ask him. I'd look pretty silly doing that. No, I'm more than willing to take your word for it. And now, would you begin all over again? Begin what? Those ideas you were advancing, those very provocative ideas concerning us. Uh-uh. I've given you too much of a lead as it is. Let's not waste time with regrets. Isn't there another spot, perhaps a little music? I know just the spot. Come on, we can slip away before they get back. Cherbourg no longer seemed gray and dreary. For me, it had suddenly assumed the atmosphere of a Mardi Gras, a mama's parade. But at the door to the hotel, there came an interruption. Going somewhere, is? That's rather obvious, isn't it? Sandra, this is Mark Donovan. Hello, Mark. Mm. <laughs> I don't blame you for going somewhere, but I'm afraid I got to part you two nights. Get lost, Mark. I'm sure that whatever you have in mind can wait. Look, Grace, you will probably want to flog me from here to Paris, but it won't wait. It's a red-hot break. It's got to be handled now. Go with him, Grace. We can make it later. Shall we say tomorrow evening? You're a very understanding person. I'm a very persistent person. See you later, Grace. Marcus? This lead of yours had better be good. It's good, chum. Let's go. Where? Spot called a bar de book. It ain't the Krillion, of course. Krillion. Yeah. Like I said, it ain't the Krillion, but it has its points. It definitely has its points. <laughs> now, ain't this something, Race? Makes you forget all about the rain outside, huh? Who are we going to talk to? And a table in the corner, guy and a dame. He's the American I was telling you about. The one that gave me the knockdown to him. Look, I, uh, I know you just left the pip, but uh, ain't this girl something? She was wearing a black suit and a beret. She had dark eyes and honey-colored hair. She was smoking a cigarette in a long holder, and she looked like something Renoir would have put on canvas. We went over, and Mark made us known to one another, identifying the girl as Annette. The man is Phil Benson. We had drinks and began a casual conversation. Benson turned out to be a paving contractor, dickering with the city of Sherbrooke for some of its road rebuilding work. But it's kind of tough. They don't want to give it to anyone but a Frenchman. I don't blame them in a way, but I could certainly save them a lot of money on know-how. Annette, Mark Donovan tells me you know something about what occurred on that salvage boat last week. Yes, Grace. I know something. Wouldn't want to tell me about it, would you? No, Grace. I will only speak of what I know to the man who's in charge of the boat. Is it a question of money? I'm yes. I could get it for you. No. No, I will only speak to that man himself. The man called Menafi. All right. We'll make it tonight. Sweet Jay at the Creon at 8 o'clock. Is that all right? Yes, sir. That is all right. <laughs> Sweet Jay at the Creon happened to be the apartment Mark and I were occupying, and I had Menifee there at 7.30. He came in with a serious face and a morose attitude, took a couple of drinks to bring him to the point of unburdening his mind. But Sandra, Ray, thank you. I don't suppose you have any idea that she and I are engaged? Engaged? No, I didn't have any such idea. Sandra didn't say anything about it this afternoon. Yes, yeah, Sandra's like that, restless. Always on the lookout for excitement, but... But I have hopes that she'll settle down. Of course, I'm sure she will. That must be our caller. 
Hello, Ernest. Come in, Ernest. This is Mr. Menifee. Hello, Annette. Ray says you have some information for him. Yes, Monsieur Menifee. I have three things to tell you. First, that I consider you a murderer. Second, that I am the mother of a dead child. And third, that I now intend to kill you with this pistol. Annette! <laughs> We'll return to the adventures of Frank Race in just about one minute. And now, back to the adventures of Frank Race. Menifee was down, but I couldn't tell how badly he'd been hurt. I was too involved with a twisting, writhing woman whose intent was to send more bullets into his body. Let me go! Let me go! You little idiot, you're not solving anything by making a play like this. Give me that gun! No, I... Give me that gun! No! I'm sorry. You left me no alternative. Now, if you're smart, you'll get out of here. Your police don't like people who use guns. Yet, I'm not going to hold you? No, get going. Very well, Rose. I see. Grace. Better stay put, Menifee. Till I get some help here. You seem too bad. You saved my life by grabbing her the way you did. She had me fooled right down to the ground. Where were you hit? It seems to be near the shoulder. Here. I'll pack it, then I'll get you a doctor. No, no doctor. I'll take care of this myself. You've got to have a doctor, Menifee. It would be terrible. No, I'll take care of it myself. Bring in a doctor and you bring in the police. I've had enough publicity on this thing. We're likely to need the police. That girl might try this again. You can take care of that for me. I'll find a persuader that I'm not at fault. I'm doing all I can to clean up the situation. But no doctor. No police. There was no doubt but that Annette would be in hiding. The next morning, Mark and I looked up Phil Benson, the roving paving contractor. Yeah, I know where she is. Why should I tell you guys? So you can make trouble for her? Look, don't be a dub, will you? We ain't gonna give her no grief. Grace wants to help her. That's right, Benson. I give you my word. All right. And I wouldn't want to give her a bum steer. She's a widow going through a bad time. And I'm nuts about it. He took us to a small flat over a wine shop on a back street. Here, Annette received us casually, as though nothing unusual had happened. But the moment I mentioned Menifee, her eyes filled with storm. You may as well know. If I get another chance to him, I shall try the same thing again. But why? You're not sure that he caused the death of your son? My son died on that man's boat. For me, that is enough. Take it easy, will you, baby? Race is only trying to find out what really happened. He's only trying to help you. I can promise that Menifee won't go to the police if you'll agree to let him alone. Hear that, baby? Why don't you relax and learn to live again? Give a guy like me a chance to make things different. Oh, let me alone. I, I don't want to talk about it. You've got to talk about it, baby, for my sake. You know how I feel about you. Just give me time to make one of these paving deals and, well, things will be different, that's all. Oh, please let me alone. She stalked out of the room and I realized the futility of trying to deal with a woman stricken as she had been. Benson looked stopped. If I can only get a break so I could take her away from here. Are you having any luck? Not with the city of Sherbrooke. They just don't listen to me. And I could do their cement paving cheaper than anyone on the continent. It looks as though I've got about as much chance as a plugged bullseye. Yeah, take with it, Tim. Things will work out. They have a way of doing that. We'll see you later, Benson. Remember me? Hello, Sandra. Why aren't you going to invite me in? Of course. Or are you reluctant to receive a lady at this late night? Can I fix you a drink? I've already had a drink. I've already had several drinks. Well, you're a big girl now. They shouldn't hurt you. I thought we had a date tonight. Date? You know we did. Well, something came up, something I couldn't avoid. Men of the talk to you, didn't you? Told you I was engaged to him. Well, aren't you? He told me he talked to you. 
You know, you had me fooled. I didn't think you'd let a thing like that slow you down. A lot of things slow me down. That's just one of them. Big, virtuous men, aren't you? Oh, I hate virtuous men. That should simplify everything, then. Should. But it doesn't. Because after I decided I hated you, I couldn't stop thinking about you. I got drunk. You make a very lovely drunk. Dory. Then I dare you to do something. I dare you to put your arms around me and say that. You think I'm not tempted? Go on, Ray. Put your arms around me and say I'm a very lovely drunk. I'll make you another drink instead. Sit down, Ducky. You're a little unstrung. As a matter of fact, I'm getting a little unstrung myself. You're a fool, Ray. I know it. At this moment, I'm probably the biggest fool in Cherbourg. In fact, I'm surprising the very devil out of myself. I'm keeping this light, Ducky, just enough glory juice to give a taste. You think Menifee's worth being loyal to? Well, he isn't. He isn't worth it at all. Here, refresh yourself. Then you'd better go home. Do you know why Menifee's suspended salvage operation? Do you know why he's not letting anybody get aboard that boat? I haven't the slightest idea, Ducky. Because they have gold aboard. A fortune in gold. Gold? That sounds a little fantastic, Sandra. Mm -hmm. They found the plane on the harbor bottom while they were grappling. A Royal Air Force plane that had been shot down during the war. He'd been carrying gold to occupied France to pay agents who wouldn't work for paper money. Yes. Yes, they did that during the war. That's why the child did. He happened to be aboard that day and someone shot him to keep him quiet. And that's why that diver turned up missing. Giordano. Doesn't that up, Sandra? If it did, why didn't Menifee just take the gold and clear out? <laughs> because he can't find it. That's the joke. Eh? It's somewhere on the boat, but he can't find it. Either the boy or, or that diver hid it before they were made. So he went everywhere for that one. But he's been looking for the chest it was found in. <laughs> Well, if I could get aboard... Just how drunk are you, Sandra? Oh, I'm, I'm pretty drunk. But I'm not too drunk. I'm not too drunk. If you could get aboard, do you think you know where it is? Maybe I do. Maybe I don't. Let's go out to that vessel, Sandra. Let's go out. Just for the ducks of it. <laughs> Can you see well enough to hold your course, Mark? you kidding. I ain't seeing my way. I'm feeling it. Oh, what a night. There she is. Cut the engine. We're going to bump. Oh, brother, what a break. We hit almost alongside the ladder. Get the bow around, Mark. All right. All right, Sandra. Uh, watch your step, will you? It's like the stairway to Buckingham Palace. Gosh, we made it. There's a light after. Come on. You know... Could be walking right into something here, something rough and tough. We can stop right now, pal. You've already walked into it. It was Freddie Troy, the killer I'd met in London. And the light shafting past an open bulkhead, I could see that under one arm he cradled a bag of some sort, while at the same time he held a gun on us. Well, well, that ain't the chum I met in England. You go around buttoning all kinds of things, don't you? You don't seem as well equipped as you were last time, Troy. Then it was a Tommy gun. Now it's just a forty-five. That's enough for this job. Get back against the wall. Gracie's going to shoot us. How'd you guess it, sister? That's far enough, punk. You mean me? Yeah, you. Now, folks, I'm sorry, but... <laughs> Mark, how'd you get that hand in your pocket? <laughs> it wasn't reaching for cigars, Junior. You had to do it. It was him or us. Oh, lady, you can put music in there. Oh, that bag. He dropped it and... It's spilling gold coins. We'll have a look at that later. First, let's see if we can do anything for Troy. Okay, Rish, but I'm afraid we're just wasting our time. Mark was right. It was a case of too much sea and too much darkness. So we turned back to the lighted cabin. And here... It's the watchman. He's dead. Shot by Troy. Yeah. Oh, I guess I won't have to feel so bad. Yes. Yes, look. Look where the coins have been hidden. What, what do you know? In a fire hose. But this is only part of it, a small part. 
Oh, we're too late. They've been carrying it away. Yes, they've been carrying it away. But I've got a small hunch that I know where we might find it. <laughs> they were both at the flat. And I got the feeling that he'd been talking to her again about going away. From the look of her, she hadn't been too responsive to his words. Hello, Reis. What did you want this time? Money, Annette. A lot of money. Money that caused the death of your child. That killed my boy? Yeah, but who would have it here? Benson would. Wouldn't you, Benson? Me? What are you talking about? I'm talking about a paving contractor calling himself Benson, who's really a deep sea diver by the name of Joe Donner. How long have you known this man, Annette? Only a few days. Since Jacques... Yes. He came to you so he could keep in touch with what was going on. It makes a grim thought, Benson, courting the kid's mother after what happened. You're crazy. You tripped yourself in a couple of ways. For one thing, no real paving man would say cement when he actually meant concrete. But you were authentic enough when you mentioned a bullseye today, because that's the term a lot of divers use for the eyepieces in their helmets. You and Freddie Troy were in this together, weren't you, Donna? You were the diver who brought up the chest of coins, which you knew would be confiscated by the government. So you took advantage of the excitement and hid the stuff. And you murdered that boy because he happened to see you. Then you made it look as though you'd been killed yourself. So you could hide out and pick up the coins later. Please, if you could prove this. Ask him to open that bag he has at his feet, Annette. I'm not opening anything. I'm just going out of here. Don't go for that gun, Annette. I know you got one, but don't go for it. I'll... Please, you... You stopped me. You let him get away. He won't go far. Not in France. And the bag's still there, baby. He didn't get the bag. I could have killed him. And you stopped me. And right now, you hate me for it. But after a while, you'll be glad I did. After a long while, you'll be very glad. The Adventures of Frank Race, starring Paul Dubov with Tony Barrett as Mark Donovan, comes to you from Hollywood. Others heard in tonight's cast were Lillian Bayef, Wilms Herbert, Paul McVeigh, Michael Ann Barrett, and Herbert Butterfield. This series is written and directed by Buckley Angel and Joel Murcott. The music is composed and played by Ivan Dittmar. Be sure to be with us again this time next week for another dramatic chapter in The Adventures of Frank Race. Art Gilmore speaking. This is a Bruce Ells production. Welcome back. Well, I don't... Uh, we've got a lot of complaints about race from uh, listeners. First time I've heard anyone uh, refer to him as uh, virtuous in that regards. But I think in this case, it definitely fit with the character. One thing I, I think some mystery writers need to watch is the um, resolution of the case where it's... Well, somebody of that occupation would not have said this, or they would have said that. It can get overused. I remember uh, them doing this, uh, using that same sort of clue that they use today, in one of the last uh, Tom Collins episodes. Well, now we turn to an email I received from uh, Bill. Um, on that, sort of on that topic, I just listened to the first Frank Race episode starring Paul Dubov. I have to disagree with you about the voice quality differences between Tom Collins and Dubov. In my opinion, Mr. Dubov's voice was much clearer and easier to understand. Frequently, it seemed to me that Tom's, Tom Collins was mumbling. I would turn up the volume on my headphones and still not be able to understand what he was saying. In contrast, I understood every word that Paul Dubov said in The Adventure of the Green to Blue. Just my two cents. Uh, and uh, thanks so much, Bill. And I wasn't necessarily saying that Collins was better. 
uh, objectively, just that I was more, yeah, I think, more used to Collins' voice. Clearly, both of them are strong actors. I always thought uh, there was something uh, debonair and um, adventurous in the way that Collins delivered his lines. Um, I'd be interested to know, and I'll put a poll up on Facebook. Ask listeners, which Frank Race do you prefer? We've now had three episodes with Paul Duvall as Race, so uh, we, we've got some basis for comparison here. Um, then turn to an email from Kevin, who writes, Hi, Adam, I'm writing again to say how much I'm enjoying both your Great Detectives and Dragnet podcast. I'm listening via iTunes and going back as far as it goes. I've heard every episode of Great Detectives now, and I'm fairly close to catching up on Dragnet. As others have mentioned, this is a mixed blessing, since it means I have to wait for new shows, but that's okay. He goes on on and asks a question uh, relevant to race. I have a couple questions. This one is not directly related to the podcast or detective shows in particular, but I figured you might have some information. It seemed that many syndicated shows, instead of leaving a 5 to 10 second uh, spread for commercials, played a one minute piece of uh, music. Did they expect announcers to read commercials over the music, or was it done to keep the program link consistent if commercials weren't used, or was there another reason? Uh, this seems to happen consistently in such shows as The Lone Ranger, The Green Horde, Philo Vance, The Avenger, uh, Five Minute Mysteries, and I think even Frank Race, although I don't know if it was original or added in later copies. Also, any idea what the waltzy little song during The Avengers break is? Uh, it sure doesn't fit the show at all. Uh, I've never listened to The Avengers, so I can't tell you. Uh, reg- I think your explanation about keeping show links uh, consistent, if, uh, for example, a show's not able to get uh, a sponsor for a particular week, uh, I think that that uh, is probably the best explanation it's not the reading over part. We don't have, as far as I know, any episodes of Frank Race that have the commercials in them, some of the local inserts. There are some uh, radio programs where there exist copies of the radio programs with some of the local commercials inserted. And uh, in those cases, they basically take out the long musical bridge. Uh, if they're not able to get the uh, commercials or... Because there are multiple segments, if, say, they're selling spot ads and they don't get an ad for every spot, uh, then they've got those musical bridges instead. So good question, and thanks for listening, Kevin. All right, well, that'll do it for today. We will be back tomorrow with A Life in Your Hands, and then join us back here next Monday for another adventure of Frank Race. And be sure and let us know on Facebook which Frank Race you prefer. Paul Devolve or Tom Collins. In the meantime, send your comments to Box13 at GreatDetectives.net. Follow us on Twitter at Radio Detectives, and uh, be sure and take our listener survey, survey.greatdetectives.net. But from Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham, signing off.